So today, um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, George Grau. Um, he's a professor of pathology at the University of Sydney, Australia. George has been working in the field of extracellular vesicles since the last century, since 1998. Uh, his particular interest for the role of EVs in immunopathology. His focus is on EV as effectors of cytokine-mediated lesions of microvascular endothelium in inflammations, notably immune complication of infections, autoimmune diseases, and cancer. He is also currently the president of Australia New Zealand Microcirculation Society. So today, uh, his talk is going to be about extracellular vesicles as essential elements in immunopathology, the example of infectious disease. So, without further ado, uh, please welcome George. Thank you very much, uh, Carolina, for the kind of introduction and. So it will be a pleasure to discuss with you uh, what we have been uh, doing with extracellular vesicles over the last few years. And uh, as Carolina said, I've been interested in immunopathology. So that's what I would like to do today is first of all, very briefly uh, define uh, what immunopathology is and discuss what we have been doing in a number of uh, infectious diseases essentially cerebral malaria. I'll just say a few words about what we did in TB and just summarize in one slide what we've been doing in the field of viral encephalitis and discuss a little bit more about uh, sepsis or at least the sepsis model in vitro. In the context of cerebral malaria, I would like to discuss what the functions of microvesicles are and share with you some recent experiments in which uh, these experiments we performed in a mouse model allowed us to identify a novel monocyte subset that is probably important in the pathogenesis of cerebral malaria. And in the case of sepsis, I would like to discuss with you some rather paradoxical effects that microvesicles can have, notably on uh, the blood-brain barrier, and uh, share with you some unpublished data uh, using vibrational spectroscopy and, and how we can characterize the vesicles produced by monocytes in the context of sepsis. So how can we define immunopathology? Well, that's a pathology that is uh, triggered by immune mechanisms. Definitely, uh, when you have some infections, the pathogen triggers a set of changes in the immune systems. Essentially, T cells here are represented. The aim is to destroy the pathogen, of course, but sometimes, either from the Th1 or from the Th17 subsets, lesions can be triggered and we group all those lesions, all those changes that are deleterious under the name immunopathology. What I'd like to say today is that, of course, immunopathology does not only involve T cells or B cells or monocytes, it also can involve the cells we have been studying for a long time, these are endothelial cells. Endothelial cells are the cells that are lining the inside of blood vessels. They can be isolated, they can be studied in culture. And clearly we have shown, we and many others have shown that these cells are not providing a passive lining of the vessels. They are rather active cells. They are, as we summarized here in this uh, book chapter for the book of Bill Ayers, they are able to receive a lot of input from either pathogens or blood cells or other uh, elements like infectious agents. And in turn, they have as an output capacity, possibility to produce their own cytokines. They produce their own microparticles. We used to call them microparticles before we named them microvesicles, of course. They can modulate uh, a lot of cell adhesion molecules on their surface. They can also uh, participate in tissue lesions when uh, endothelial cell viability is altered, for instance. So the first model we have uh, studied for a number of years now is cerebral malaria. It still remains a major problem of public health at the world level. It is characterized by the accumulation in brain microvessels of, of course, infected erythrocytes, but also host cells like white blood cells and platelets. And when you examine the brain of patients who die with cerebral malaria, you see an accumulation of those malarial pigments here. And you see a number of leukocytes that are also plugging the vessels. Uh, 
This can lead in some areas of the brain to such lesions, of course, evidence for hemorrhagic necrosis. And for a number of years now, we have tried to address the question, what are the mechanisms leading to these deathly lesions? What we have tried to do is to really try and, and understand what is in this black box between the pathogen, Plasmodium falciparum, and humans, and the end-stage lesion, which is here depicted on the right of the slide, where the brain and the cereal vessels are plugged with the red blood cells containing the parasites and also white blood cells. I won't talk today about all the things we've been doing, uh, trying to decipher the role of uh, immune cell subsets, but rather discuss what is happening at the end stage lesion here, what is altering the brain and the cereal function, what creates the dysfunction leading to neurological signs that are characteristic of cerebral malaria. Very clearly, we realize that there are at least two levels of complexity in this uh, very complex syndrome. First of all, if you look at the brain vessel here, the first level of, an, of complexity uh, is represented by the interactions between the red blood cells, the monocytes, platelets, and the vessel wall. They also, of course, interact with each other. But the second level of complexity is that each cell type, including the parasitized red cell, is capable of releasing what we used to call microparticles and that we now need to call microvesicles, of course. These vesicles are produced within the lumen of the, ve the brain vessels, but they also can go outside of the vessels and modify the behavior of glial cells as well as neurons. We have been focusing on microvesicles, and you will see in some slides they are still called microparticles. I don't need to describe in front of this audience what the various families of EVs are. Uh, just to say that we focused our attention on the microvesicles first. Just you will see why in the next slide. And recently, since uh, Elham Hosseini uh, Beheshti joined the team, we have also been uh, investigating the role of exosomes. We probably will talk about these uh, latest uh, results in uh, one of the next Web EV talk, maybe in the American Web EV talk. But let's see why we were interested in microvesicles uh, to start with. That reason was the fact that we could show with Valérie Combe uh, many years ago, and as Carolina said, that was last century indeed, that our favorite cytokine, tumor necrosis factor, can dramatically enhance the production of microvesicles, microparticles, by endothelial cells, which are the cells we studied most in the context of cerebral malaria. We could show that this was a dose-dependent effect and it could be blocked by a neutralizing antibody to TNF. And the next step was to ask the question, what happens in patients with cerebral malaria since we had shown that these patients have a lot of TNF in their plasma? at the time of neurological complications. And it was possible to show in uh, the first study here in Malawian children with cerebral malaria, that indeed uh, microparticles from the endothelial origin were dramatically elevated at the time of the acute onset of the disease, only in patients with cerebral malaria, but not at all in uh, children who had severe malarial anemia here, SMA, of course, in the poor kids who had both cerebral malaria and severe malarial anemia, uh, these levels were also very high. And interestingly, these high numbers of microphysicals, microparticles, went back to normal at the time of follow-up when the patients uh, were treated. And also interestingly, at the acute phase level, uh, those endothelial microparticle numbers correlated very well with the plasma TNF levels, so clearly, showing a, a relationship between the two uh, parameters. This was confirmed in another series of studies in many other epidemiological settings, notably in Cameroon and in Vietnam. We found that whole blood cells and also endothelial cells participated in the massive increase in the circulating microparticle levels. And in the mouse model, we found that a specific deletion of the ABCA1 gene uh, resulted in, in a much lower production of microparticles. And quite interestingly, these mice were fully protected against cerebral malaria here. As you can see with the survival curve, the ABC1 knockout mice completely uh, 
were protected against the lethality of cerebral malaria. They died later with anemia, but this is not due to the immune response. This is just due to the parasite. So altogether, this suggested that these microvesicles can have an important role in the pathogenesis. So we tried to switch to in vitro studies and analyze functions of microvesicles, microparticles. As a source, we took platelets because these were very abundant in the circulation of patients and also mice uh, with cerebral malaria. And the target cell, we took, of course, our favorite cells, which are brain and the cereal cells and study the number of uh, changes that could be triggered by the uh, attachment of microvesicles on the surface of these brain and the cereal cells used as a target. And to summarize the work of uh, Dorothee Fay, who was the last student we got from Europe in the lab here in, in Sydney, she showed that platelet-derived microparticles, which we called PMP at that time, readily bound to the surface of brain and the cereal cells and also became internalized. They were in very various compartments, so these things have been uh, now published. <clears throat> Interestingly, when we label the membrane of the microparticles and the content, that the intracellular, intracytoplasmic content of the microparticles, we could show, or if I could show, that uh, those uh, components were dissociated after 90 minutes following the internalization, that was very clear that this induced very strong changes in brain and the cereal cells. But what mattered for the pathology of cerebral malaria was about the adhesiveness of these and the cereal cells. So we performed some binding assays, either by adding the platelet microparticles before or after the red blood cells containing the malaria parasites. And to make a long story short also here, very clearly, microparticles from platelet origins significantly enhance the cytoadherence of those um, malaria-infected erythrocytes. So clearly the hallmark of cerebral malaria pathology, which is the plugging of brain vessels, was amplified by microparticles. That's what we did in the field of platelet-derived um, microparticles. And then we tried to study what they could do on the integrity of endothelial cells using a system that measures the trans-endothelial electrical resistance, TEER, as we call it. And we could find that indeed, if we add platelet microparticles, when these brain endothelial cells have reached a good level of uh, junctions, clearly those microparticles of platelet uh, origins cause a drop in the TEER, very much like the positive control here, Taxol. So clearly, there can be deleterious for uh, the viability and, and the functions of endothelial cells. So then we switched our attention to the EVs that are produced by the parasite itself. And by scanning electron microscopy, we could see that these vesicles produced by the parasite, PBA is the name of the parasite which infects mice, Plasmodium berga and cat. They look very much like the vesicles produced uh, when uh, uninfected erythrocytes are injected into uh, mice. So they look very, very uh, identical, but what are their functions? And in a collaboration with Brian de Souza in the London School of Tropical Medicine, we could show that indeed these uh, microparticles from parasite origins are carrying parasite material, parasite antigens here. But more importantly, we could show that these uh, parasite-derived microparticles do enhance the expression of CD40 on uh, monocytes, and they trigger a, a very, very significant release in TNF by these macrophages, those macrophages under stimulation by PBA-derived microparticles, are extremely high. This is not very different from what uh, we could see from LPS-induced microparticles, but clearly the microparticles produced by the parasites are much more pro-inflammatory than <clears throat> microparticles produced by LPS themselves. So we'll talk about LPS a bit later in the talk today. At this stage, we can say that clearly, as you can see in this panel here, CD40 expression and TNF production 
were dramatically enhanced by the microparticles from the parasites, but not so much by the microparticles triggered by LPS. The next aspect we studied was, of course, the functions of endothelial cells as antigen-presenting cells. Uh, we know that they do not have all the capacities that a macrophage or a B cell can have. <clears throat> they are called semi-professional antigen-presenting cells, but in various projects, we were able to show that brain endothelial cells can indeed pick up antigens from the parasite and stimulate <coughs> excuse me, the proliferation of immature T cells. The question was, could microparticles produced by those brain endothelial cells also trigger the proliferation of immature T cells. And to make a long story short again, it was possible to show that produ uh, produced by endothelial cells, these microparticles readily form conjugates with T cells here, both of the CD4 and the CD8 phenotype. This is something that we could see between dendritic cells and T cells, those conjugates. And that resulted in a significant enhancement of CD4 uh, positive T cell proliferation. This is a work we dedicated to the memory of our friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Charlotte Baer, who was really dedicated to malaria patients. You see here in, the, in uh, Addis Abeba, in some of the work we, we did in Africa, she was a great colleague and, and highly dedicated uh, researcher in the field of malaria. So to summarize many of the studies that were performed in the lab and with collaborators, we can say that microparticles are indeed uh, triggered by TNF. Their levels are very high in patients with cerebral malaria. When you block their production, either with a gene deletion or with some pharmacological agents, uh, you block cerebral malaria pathology. They are able to transfer antigens. They are able to activate T cells. They are able to activate macrophages. They alter permeability of endothelial cells, etc. But what about the direct pathogenic effect? As an experimental pathologist, of course, we like to do some direct intervention studies. So we switch back to the mouse model. And in this model, that's the work of uh, another very good student in the lab, Fatima, who uh, took microparticles from normal mice or from mice that are developing cerebral malaria. She labeled these microparticles by a membrane intercalant agent and injected them either in normal or in uh, infected uh, recipient mice, studying a number of things, of course, tissue distributions, the kinetics of that, and particularly the localization of these microparticles. And what she could show is that when you inject exogenous microparticles into recipient mice, they go and get stuck exactly where the lesions occur in cerebral malaria. That is not in the capillaries, but in the post-capillary venules. That's very clear. Further than that, we generated uh, using mouse uh, brain endothelial cells that we had prepared still in, when I was still in Switzerland, stimulated these mouse brain endothelial cells with our favorite cytokine, and the cytokine, which is in high number, in high concentration in cerebral malaria, we generated endothelial microparticles in vitro and injected them intravenously into healthy recipients. By healthy, I mean without any uh, parasite. And we could observe when we inject, when we looked at the brain of these mice that mice injected with endothelial microparticles readily developed hemorrhages very much like in the context of cerebral malaria. The next slide shows you what you see here, clear evidence of hemorrhages exactly like what happens in a mouse which is infected with Plasmodium bergai anca. Of course, in the mice which were transferred with EMP and the cellular microparticles, we didn't see the occluded vessels because of course there was no parasite here in the system. So we can summarize in the field of cerebral malaria that we have evidence suggesting that microparticles are very important pathogenic elements, important players, as we say here. They are high at the time of pathology, both in humans and in, in mice. When you block their production, you block pathology. And then, as you just saw, when you inject microparticles, you can trigger pathology. 
Now, because of their uh, role in pathogenesis seems pretty clear, could these EVs serve as biomarkers? And that's been the work uh, of uh, Valérie Combe and, and very good uh, students as well. I don't need to explain to this audience that indeed microparticles carry a lot of things, not only on their surface, but also inside. Their cargo is well known by all of you. So that's the work of Natalia Tiberti, who joined from Switzerland, and, and Valérie Combe. They analyzed uh, proteomics of those microparticles produced during uh, the infection by the Plasmodium bergai anca and compared mice with and without the neurological syndrome. They were able to identify two molecules, specifically carboanhydrase 1 and one member of the S100 family, S100AA, that are extremely high in microparticles, microvesicles, uh, produced during the syndrome in mice called experimental cerebral malaria and not in other uh, conditions. These things were confirmed by <coughs> Western blood and also uh, by ELISA. Those uh, two molecules are thus potential markers of disease severity. I'd like to spend some time on, on some recent experiments in which we were studying uh, the subsets of monocytes that are involved in cerebral malaria. Well, as you know, there are several subsets. Uh, the classical monocytes are expressing high levels of this molecule called LY6C, but there are the so-called non-classical monocytes, which have very low level of this molecule. That's why they are called LY6C low. We are interested in monocytes because we've shown many years ago, and that's uh, intravitreal microscopy here, that you have a massive accumulation of monocytes exactly at the time of cerebral malaria. And uh, when we deplete mice with uh, clodronate liposomes, we can indeed produce uh, very strong, long survival. Here, mice die with anemia and not at all with cerebral malaria like this. And you can downmodulate monocytes and T cells with liposomes. So we were interested to understand better <clears throat> what monocyte subsets could be. Uh, together with Nick King and, and his colleagues, we were able to analyze by uh, high dimensional flow cytometry, as it's called now, uh, the monocyte populations that are blocked in the brain during the syndrome. And we had studied the, the effluent cells from these brains. And by TISNI analysis, we could identify several populations here. Population one, this one, population two, and population three. <clears throat> because of the high dimensional cytometry uh, power, we were able to identify those LY6C low cells, which are distinct from the microglial cells, and indeed found that the LY6C low are uh, abundant at the time of cerebral malaria. Using artificial microparticles called IMP for immunomodulating uh, particles, uh, we could downmodulate these uh, LY6C low monocytes that had been shown already in the field of uh, West Nile virus encephalitis by the group of Nick King. And very clearly, if we inject those IMPs alone in a fully lethal syndrome, we have something like a 50% protection, 50%. That doesn't seem much, but in a fully lethal syndrome, that's a clearly significant biologically. And this resulted in a <clears throat> nearly an ablation of the pathology in the brain here. You can see uh, a lot of accumulation in brain microvessels. This is significantly reduced in the case of IMP treatment. That was also true in the lung. Those microparticles of exogenous origins, those artificial microparticles, were able to block the pathology at that level. Then when we combined these IMPs with uh, an anti-malarial agent, artesunate in particular, we could lead, uh, we could produce something like a more eight, nearly 90% protection. This reduced the incidence of the neurological syndrome very significantly. And also interestingly, those treated mice were fully uh, resistant to a re-challenge with the parasite, so suggesting that uh, they had acquired a decent level of immunity. And interestingly, that's another piece of evidence that <clears throat> microvesicle levels 
are always correlated with pathology, those IMP treatments reduce the sequestration of malaria parasites. That's very clear here. But they also clearly reduce the number of circulating endogenous microvesicles in those animals, bringing them back to normal, exactly at the level of non-infected mice. So just a couple of words now of what we did in the field of TB before we switch to sepsis with uh, rather recent and, and unpublished results. Together with uh, Bernadette Saunders and uh, Warwick Britton, we were interested to evaluate how microparticles produced by macrophages infected by their pathogen, not only our pathogen, which is Plasmodium falciparum, could modify the behavior of not only antigen-presenting cells, but also the behavior of T cells, notably in terms of uh, proliferation. So the first thing we did was to infect monocytes with uh, various mycobacteria, BCG first, but even mycobacterium tuberculosis, thanks to the facilities that uh, Warwick Britain has created in Sydney, can handle this uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis and very clearly these microparticles when added to naive monocytes they can significantly activate these uh, recipient monocytes that can be uh, evidenced by the production of MIP1 alpha for instance but also our thyroid cytokine like a TNF. In vivo, in addition, it was possible to show that these microparticles produced by mycobacterium tuberculosis infected macrophages could trigger the recruitment of neutrophils in the skin. Here it's depicted uh, what happens in the ear of animals that were injected with these microparticles and intravitreal microscopy clearly showed a recruitment here of neutrophils at the site of injection. So they were clearly chemotactic. They also uh, are chemotactic for macrophages in uh, dermal uh, conditions and also dermal uh, dendritic cells as shown here, also in, in studies performed in mice with the group of Warwick Britain. Interestingly, when we looked where those microparticles went, we found them uh, in the recycling and the zones, notably here you can see the co-localization with, with RAB11A, suggesting that uh, they are stuck at this level and therefore um, perhaps from that stage modify the behavior of recipient cells. And the last thing we were asking in the field of those microparticles produced by uh, MTB was how they could modify an antigen-specific T-cell response. And here we have used uh, cell clone, CD4 positive T cell clone, which is specifically reacting to the P25 peptide. And as you can see here, both in vitro and in vivo, those microparticles were able to significantly uh, increase the production of pro proliferation of these T cells. So clearly, there was an antigen specific CD4 positive T cell response amplified by these microparticles. Just one slide to tell you what we did in the field of viral encephalitis in the West Nile virus model with uh, Nick King and Zheng Ling here, his uh, PhD student. We were able to show that microparticles which carry viral antigens from the very beginning when the virus is uh, injected in the skin by the vector, and then we could show that these microparticles participate in the migration of inflammatory cells into the central nervous system with a lot of changes here resulting in a neuronal damage that is characteristic of viral encephalitis. Now I'd like to end by discussing a bit what we have been doing in the field of sepsis. And uh, as I said to start with, uh, analyze rather some rather paradoxical effects of microparticles. Here the system was very simplified. We didn't use uh, live bacteria yet. We have essentially used the LPS stimulation of 
monocytes, macrophages in vitro, and analyzed what these microparticles from monocytic origins could do on our human brain endothelial cells, model of blood-brain barrier, how they would modify the behavior of these human brain endothelial cells, what they could do in terms of signaling changes. The case of microparticles or microvesicles in sepsis is a bit more complex than in other infectious diseases because there are many papers, and I only listed a few here, many papers uh, suggesting that they can be pathogenic and nearly as many papers suggesting that they can be protective. So here are only a few papers, notably uh, that, that one by Soriano and colleagues, suggesting that microparticles could be associated with a favorable outcome, uh, and microparticle and, and cell conjugates could be predicting a favor uh, favorable outcome. Conversely, uh, the group of uh, Renk Newland and or even Orla Barry in 98, so a long time ago also, suggested that uh, microparticles could be increasing the monocyte binding. So that's been the work of another very good student in the lab, Beryl, uh, to analyze what happens when you stimulate monocytes with LPS. So she showed that the numbers of these uh, microparticles were increased using the Monomax 6 cell line here, more than the THP1. Clearly, uh, numbers were increased, and the phenotype of those uh, microparticles was clearly a pro inflammatory and a pro coagulant phenotype. We have uh, published all these things. She then analyzed what these microparticles can do on the system of the blood brain barrier and again studied transendocelial electrical resistance. To our surprise, while the monocytes can uh, decrease very significantly the TEER, therefore suggesting an opening of the tight junction, paradoxically, the monocytic microparticles, either produced by uh, resting monocytes or by LPS-stimulated monocytes, these ones were increasing the TEER, so potentially preventing uh, those brain and the serial cells from being uh, altered and from being open. This uh, was associated with a reduction of SARC phosphorylation here. You can see PSARC was reduced by the numbers of microparticles added on the brain and the serial cells. And there was indeed, with these microparticles from monocytic origin, a modulation of the junctional pro uh, proteins, notably VE cadherin and uh, zona occludens 1 molecules. These ones were uh, increased by um, monocytic microparticles. So a rather strange effect of monocytic microparticles in this setting. I'd like to end up by uh, discussing some of the, the imaging modalities that we have used to understand better those uh, microparticles those vesicles released upon LPS stimulation. And together with the group of Peter Lay here, in the School of Chemistry at the University of Sydney, we've used a lot of techniques which are grouped under the, the barbarian name vibrational spectroscopy. We've done quite a bit uh, using Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. I won't discuss uh, the other techniques here. The FTIR, as we call it, uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy has a number of, of advantages. Actually, they are not something that can uh, replace, of course, proteomics or other omics at the moment, but they have, among others, the, uh, the advantage of providing us with direct information on the changes that are occurring in the cells, also in the vesicles, even in the medium, actually. There's no sampling issues. It's a semi-quantitative method. It can, modify, it can assess the changes in lipids, proteins, DNA, etc. as you will see one or two examples now. And importantly, this uh, technique is sensitive to uh, the conformation of molecules. We can pick up rather easily some alpha helical and beta shield protein changes. It's very simple in principle, but I would be unable, of course, to discuss with you the 
the, the fine details of the physics of the Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy and also the bio ATR, which we have used more recently, attenuated total reflectance. The principle is simple, though. Uh, the sample to be examined, be it the cell or the vesicle, is uh, bombarded with high energy sources and the machine is detecting the vibration of individual atoms in the, in the sample. So that looks very simple with a small molecule like this, but of course it's a little bit more complicated when you take the microparticles that are either produced by resting monocytes or by LPS uh, stimulated monocytes. Those are the second derivatives of the very complex spectral profiles that are uh, recorded in those uh, conditions. You can see changes in lipid esters, in alpha helix proteins, and of course, of molecules of interest for people who work with microvesicles, microparticles, we found an increase in the phosphatidylserine and a decrease in the phosphatidylcholine in these uh, microparticles. Clearly, that was uh, true at a given time point, but also at various time points, we could see changes in those uh, spectral profiles. That's something we've already published a couple of years ago now with the group of Peter Lake. Now, by PCA, principal component analysis, we were able to identify those uh, vesicles that were either resting or LPS uh, stimulated. The monocytes were either resting or LPS stimulated. That was changing over time and clearly suggesting that the biomolecular content of these vesicles can be uh, assessed by uh, vibrational spectroscopy. And last but not least, uh, we do now have a number of experiments in which we try to broaden a little bit our uh, stimulation panel and not just use uh, LPS and later on, hopefully, uh, in the next future, uh, live bacteria, but cytokines to mimic Th1 inflammation we used interferon gamma and to mimic Th2 type of inflammation we used IL-4. And as a target cell, we used uh, various types of monocytes, essentially THP1 cells. When we analyze the monocytes that are stimulated with all these uh, various uh, agonists, we could say that vibrational spectroscopy, in this case bio-ATR, does not allow you to make any conclusion. That's a very messy PCA here. Uh, since I'm in Australia, I learned the expression, it's messy like a dog's breakfast. And indeed, this is so messy that you cannot identify who is who here. However, when we took the vesicles produced by these monocytes, we found by PCA, just PCA, one, PC1 and PC2 here, that there is a 100% or nearly 100% segregation of those uh, biomolecular profiles. Non-stimulated monocytes producing vesicles are here. LPS-stimulated vesicles would be here. Gamma interferon and IL-4 clearly highly separated. So bioATR is a method of choice to try and identify changes in the vesicular um, content. So to summarize, we could say that extracellular vesicles are clearly novel mechanisms of inflammation. Things I haven't showed you in terms of your timing here is that they can participate in the very early stages of binding of the malaria parasites. Microparticles essentially from platelet origin would bind to the surface of the ultra large von Willebrand factor string formation on endocelial cells. Endocelial cells are represented by those elliptic cells here. Clearly, the adhesiveness for parasitized blood blood cells is increased. Both the infected erythrocytes and the platelets can produce vesicles that alter endothelial cell integrity that increases the sequestration of parasites and also increases the procoagulant activity. In the field of LPS stimulation, we found increases of the TEER, the transendocelial electrical resistance, and also increased of adhesiveness. 
increasing the adjacentness of endothelial cells, endothelial cells that can also be altered by these microparticles. And with more immunological uh, parameters uh, being studied, we found that endothelial cells and monocytes can produce microparticles that are spreading the antigens to other cells, notably to other macrophages, and also participate in the presentation of antigens to T cells and increase their uh, capacity to proliferate, so amplifying immune-mediated uh, changes. And together with Elham, uh, we have summarized what extracellular vesicle involvement in immunopathology can be. Well, we have at the center here our favorite cell, the microvascular endothelial cells. These cells receive from circulating cells a number of extracellular vesicles. Of course, the subset of these need to be analyzed further, but they also receive from the outside of the vessels extracellular vesicles produced by cells in the tissues themselves, like pericytes, which are around endothelial cells in, in vessels, and also uh, further away mesangial cells in, in the kidney, and importantly, an important source uh, of microparticles, microvesicles, are the smooth muscle cells. And under the stimulation of these EVs, endothelial cells in turn will produce their own EVs, which have a number of properties, which we just briefly summarized today. They can be pro and anti inflammatory, so it's very complex. They certainly disseminate the procoagulant atmosphere. They participate in increasing vascular permeability. They can be cytotoxic, they can lead to cell death, and they can be either pro or anti-angiogenic. Therefore, they can have a number of effects, including uh, on cancer cells and also stem cells in addition to glial cells. So I'd like to end by thanking people in the lab, people who did the work, uh, people who are, were there before, notably Fatima, Charissa, Dorothée, and, and Valérie Combe, uh, a long-term collaborator. And in the lab, essentially, the work of Elham and Annette and Pierre Gia, who have been working for a number of years now, the group of Nick Hunt, the group in viral immunology, and Warwick Britain and Bernadette Saunders at the Jenner Institute, and colleagues uh, in Africa and also uh, colleagues in Melbourne for the malaria parasite studies. And uh, last but not least, Pierre-Olivier Corot, an expert in uh, brain endothelium. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, George. It's a great pleasure to have you uh, on this um, occasion, joining us here at the EV Web, Web EV Talks. So uh, this, uh, this uh, presentation is open for discussion. And the way you present your, your question is by putting it into the, into the chat. I will ask you to unmute yourself and open your video to ask the question. And I think we start with Susanne Gabrielson. Uh, I know she's at the Karolinska Institute. I don't know where everybody else is. So you will have to tell everywhere, everybody where you work. So Susanne. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, now I lost the thing I wrote there, but uh, what I Do wanted to ask... Yeah, I wanted to ask you about... Um, you, you showed that the TNF were stimulating uh, microparticle production from the endothelial cells, but yes. then you... Uh, you jump to the platelets and use those in the, so I missed the link between those. Are the platelets also um, releasing more microparticles in response to TNF? And what is the difference between the uh, endothelial and platelet derived? And, yes, that, that's an important question. There is no direct link between TNF and the platelets, except that I am very interested in both, but, uh, Platelets are uh, strongly activated during uh, malarial infection, and particularly at the time of cerebral malaria, we found that there are many features of platelet activation. And we found that there are lots of microparticles from platelet origin at the time of the neurological syndrome. That's why we use platelets uh, in uh, 
those in vitro studies. Now, the question has been uh, asked many times, and we still are working on the question, which are the most pathogenic ones? Are they the microparticles from platelet origin or those from endothelial origin? At the moment, I would say both are potentially pathogenic in the context of cerebral malaria. Even uh, endothelial-derived microparticles can be toxic for other endothelial cells. They can disseminate, as you know, the procoagulant, the prothrombotic, and the pro-inflammatory atmosphere. So it's hard to say which one is uh, the most important in pathogenesis, but I would definitely rank platelet and endothelial microparticles as the two most uh, dangerous microparticles. If we can say. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. So the next, next question is from Nader Kameli. So please state where you're from and open your video and stuff. Hi, yeah, I'm from Maastricht University in Netherlands. Uh, just wondering, like, because you check the tear measurement, uh, did you apply them, like, on the radical side or on uh, the bilateral side, the microparticles? I, I hear you very faintly. Can you say that again? Sorry. I mean, you check the tear measurement when you apply the microparticles, but I'm just wondering if you apply them on the radical side or on the bilateral side. On top and of the cells or under the cell, basically. Ah, yes. Yeah. That is that is been only added on the luminal side of the of the endothelial cells. We haven't been able to model yet an addition of microvesicles on the abluminal side. Uh, usually, we culture endothelial cells on a on a flat surface. They need to have some uh, uh, glycocalyx or uh, some um, basement membrane uh, to to attach properly to the surface. They wouldn't like plastic itself. So we only added uh, microvesicles on the luminal side, if that's the question you ask. I'm sorry yeah. I didn't hear you very well. And the second question, like, did you try if uh, those my microbiotics can also recover uh, the decreasing and the integrity by applying, for example, TNF alpha and then apply the microbiotics again? That we haven't done. That would be a great study to do, yes alter them and then see if uh, they can be yes. repairing that. that we haven't done sorry that's a very good idea you should yeah, come to the lab in sydney and do the experiment with us yes. well, there you the go moment. you have an opening right there and now yes yeah it's you can not, travel to australia to enter, without quarantine if, ideally right yeah it's not easy to enter australia at the moment but uh, you'd be welcome in the lab and we could do experiments along that line with you yeah Yes. So, uh, 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 please, uh, Esther Nolte. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the very uh, nice uh, talk. I was actually wondering uh, something that you may not or you do have inve in, uh, investigated or maybe you have an, uh, an idea about it. Uh, do you think that the circulating uh, microparticles uh, would directly interact with uh, the endothelial cells under flow? Or do you think that rather uh, other cells need to kind of stick or adhere to the endothelial cells first, then release the microparticles and uh, interact? Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> asking this. We have, we have done a, a number of experiments in flow conditions. And notably, those experiments I only evoked in the summary slide uh, using endothelial cells that would produce those ultra-large von Willebrand factor strings. These really are strings of macromolecules, th those ones can only be done in flow conditions, actually, because if you study endothelial cells in the static conditions, those ultra-large uh, molecules will not develop. They will say sm small molecules. So yes, they do bind to endothelial cells under flow conditions, very much like platelets. They, they can bind in, let's say, the the shear stress conditions of the microcirculation, at least. We are not talking about what's going on in the aorta here or in, in large arteries, of course, but in, in flow conditions that reproduce the microcirculation, yes, the answer is yes. We, we still have done, let's say, very limited numbers of experiments in these flow chambers, but we, we should do more indeed. We, we postulate, to answer your second part of the question, we postulate that microvesicles, microparticles, can directly bind in vivo to those uh, altered endothelial cells, 
particularly where there has been what we call endothelial denudation, you know, they can, they can definitely be attracted there. But it is not impossible that, of course, indirectly produced microvesicles by leukocytes also play a role in that, naturally. But directly, to answer your question, yes, they, they can bind on the flow. Have you uh, investigated what kind of adhesion molecules are involved in this? Yes, uh, we, we've published only a few uh, attempts to block that. Definitely CD40 and CD40 ligand, which is uh, now called CD154, are important. We also could block with antibodies to CD41, which is, as you know, the immunodominant molecule on the platelet side. Uh, what else have we found? Essentially CD40, CD154, CD41. Uh, we have, in some conditions, been able to block the binding with anti-ICAM antibodies because we and others have found that there was some LFA1 equivalent on platelets. So that, that was also uh, a possibility to reduce the binding, but not completely block it with anti-ICAM. That's what we call the immune-mediated platelet sticking rather than, than just the classical sticking uh, in view of uh, blood clot formation, of course. Yeah, we we still we still should do a, a lot more along that line. And as I said to the, the colleague before, Nader, you're welcome to come to Sydney and do a few experiments with that. Platelets are really fascinating little things. <laughs> okay. Can I, can I also much. come to Sydney, please? Oh, of, <laughs> of course, we would love to have you all here, and we can only hope that we'll be able to interact in in real. Uh, soon and well, Zoom is a great instrument, of course, but yeah. it would be great to have you all here, yeah. face to face. Australia so is I, a great I place a, to be. Uh, I, I, I would like to enthuse others to ask questions. I have a few questions to you regarding the interaction between uh, vesicles and endothelium. Yes. And and one of the things that you mentioned was that postcapillary venules were very specifically involved. That reminds yeah. me of some very early work I did in my scientific career. We looked at plasma exudation uh, or swelling of tissues, which happens exclusively in the uh, postcapillary venules, right? You Absolutely. induce the histamine or leukotrienes or, or anything, that's, mm -hmm. that's where it that's happens. True. So, so um, is there a uniqueness to that endothelial layer? And, and what, is that, what is that uniqueness? Uh, we, we certainly don't know it at the molecular level, but it's been shown by let's say classical experiments, which were performed by uh, Guido Maino in Geneva before he moved to Harvard in, in Boston, uh, where he showed that if you trigger inflammation, either with small molecule agonist or even uh, massive things like LPS, uh, you don't have a leakage of uh, carbon particles in, in his classical experiments. He injected India ink into, into animals, but mm -hmm. you don't have anything leaking at the capillary level, certainly nothing leaking at the arterial level, nothing leaking at the venule level, but only at the post-capillary venule level. So clearly there are molecular differences in terms of possibilities to contract, you know, the, the tight junctions are becoming open because the endothelial cells become contractile and, and, and they create gaps between themselves and the neighbors and the neighboring cells. It's definitely demonstrated that there is a specific sensitivity of the postcapillary venule, venule endothelial cells, but to my knowledge, the, the molecular reasons for that are not known. That's definitely something that should be uh, investigated further, but uh, you're absolutely right. Those areas of the microcirculation have a particular reactivity to not only cytokines, but also small molecules, histamine and, and a few others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people from the phage display uh, field suggest that you can home certain uh, or, or home to certain areas of the of the vasculature, separate organs. But I, I, I am curious about how the endothelium is endothelium could be different in joints and brain and 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 kidney, for example. Um, there, there certainly should be some difference, but I don't know what they are. 
Uh, that's clear. Uh, well, for the blood-brain barrier, we know that the tight junctions are much tighter than in the rest of yes, the, sure, the body. Sure. And at the other extreme of the microcirculatory bed, uh, we know that uh, in the liver, notably the endothelium is fenestrated, as you know, but uh, apart from those extremes, the liver on the one hand and the brain on the other hand, there are possibly uh, organ or tissue specific features of endothelial cells. As far as I know, again, we, we don't know the molecular detail. It would be a dream actually to have a marker for exactly. a, a, a brain endothelial cell. Uh, there was in the in the late 90s, there was this molecule called EB4, if I remember well, or EB8, uh, that was proposed as a, as a specific uh, cerebral endothelial marker, but it was not confirmed by other groups. It would be right. a dream to know exactly what uh, uh, intestinal endothelial cell uh, carries uh, as opposed to a lung endothelial cell or a brain endothelial cell, but or a dermal endothelial cells, but to my knowledge, that's not has not, that's has not been defined. Yeah. We'd love because to. Because if we knew that, mm. there's a bad noise from my from my microphone or something. If we knew that, we could home vesicles, for example, to specific tissues. But we don't know that yet. So, yeah, so that when that knowledge dream. is there, we could design our our exosomes or vesicles to home to specific. Yeah, that, that would be a dream, and um, yeah. I, I'm sure people are working on that at the moment, but. Uh, with uh, so, differential proteomics or things like that. Maybe yeah. it will be known uh, sometime soon. And then when it's known, it will be really exciting. Yeah, I agree. So I have another question to you that has been uh, brought up previously uh, in, in different fora, which is how do you think, do you think the vesicles can penetrate or be transported over tight endothelium? And if so, uh, how, for example, for for biomarker discovery and so on. I mean, in, in cancer and in inflammation, there's a, there's a disruption of the endothelium. So there could potentially be traffic in both yeah. directions. But yeah. then in inflammation, usually the flow, the, the flow is from the, uh, from the bloodstream through albumin, bringing liquid with it to the tissue, causing swelling. So there's not so much other flow towards the, towards the, um, towards the blood, or do you think that happens through, through lymph, the lymph system? The lymph system, I really don't know much about it, but it's been demonstrated over the last 12 months that even glial vesicles and neuronal vesicles are found in the blood, in, even in normal conditions. So there is obviously some passage. The notion of blood-brain barrier is a, is a very um, abstract notion now because uh, it was also shown before we talked about vesicles that mm. T cells can go back and forth inside the brain. You know, that's the work of uh, Hartmut Wickerle in, in Munich, notably, uh, to show that T cells can freely pass the so called blood brain barrier and they only stay in the brain parenchyma if there is something wrong going on there, notably in multiple sclerosis or other inflammatory diseases of the central nervous system. So the, the barrier is not a 100% tight barrier for sure. We have only analyzed uh, the way vesicles enter endothelial cells and we followed them in various compartments. Th those things have been published by, by us, by others. We haven't studied though what they can do in terms of delivering the vesicles in the brain. That is a whole area of investigation that also I would like to enter one day, but not much is known about that. But as, I, as I said, we know that endothelial cells from neurons and from glial cells can be found in the, in the circulating blood. So clearly the, the barrier is not a, an absolute barrier. Well, it, it, it could be that they come through the lymph system, I guess from it's possible, the tissue yeah. to the to the blood so that's not it's possible Th those famous glymphatics uh, as they are called uh, th that's a subject of debate also and here in australia we have colleagues in melbourne notably who who say that those uh, lymphatics of the central nervous system that's not true and that's not mm -hmm. new because they belong actually to the meningi and not to the central nervous system and the parenchyma itself but uh, it, you're right, it's, it's possibly passing through the, the lymphatic system. 
So with that, I think we have exhausted all the questions. If there's nobody else asking any questions, uh, I would like to thank you very much, George, thank again. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very and, much. And uh, give over the, um, to Carolina. Um, yeah, thank you so much, George. This is a lot of uh, information and this wonderful talk. And we learned so much about the, uh, the microparticles, uh, microfascicles, which is like, um, quite rare to find a study that is like so tight uh, and being presented here. And also we learn a lot about uh, how the microfascicles increase the red blood cell adaptiveness and procoagulation activity and how they amplify uh, the immune mediated changes. I think that's, that's really fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing that with us. And uh, thank you, Jan, also for uh, leading the questions and answers.